everyone. Um, thank you for joining the San Francisco Assessor's Office Media Roundtable. I'm Vivian Poe, Communications Director to Assessor Recorder Carmen Chu. So as many of you know, um, our office is responsible for um, implementing and administ administrating state property tax laws. And like any other elected assessor in the county of California, we follow the state um, property tax laws. And in the November election, we have a new set of laws coming to us because of the passage of Proposition 19. It is um, a proposition that uh, will create changes to property transfers among families, seniors, disabled persons, and uh, victims of natural disasters. And the first part of the law is actually going to be effective pretty soon, right after the new year. And that's why Assessor Carmen Chu has been taking a great leadership in initiating this community uh, outreach and education campaign across the city to help family understand what is happening and how can they pre best prepare for the changes. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Assessor Carmen Chu here to explain to us the changes that are coming and some of the timelines so that we would be clear about the implementation. Thank you. Carmen, please take the stage. Thank you so much, Vivian, and welcome everybody. And thank you so much for joining us this morning um, as we share some important information for your own uh, viewers and your readers and your constituents. Uh, my name is Carmen Chu. I serve as San Francisco's elected assessor. And as Vivian mentioned, there is um, 58 counties in the state of California. And with the passage of Proposition 19, each of the counties will have to implement this law going forward. And so I think this is um, important because regardless of whether you live in San Francisco or you live in Oakland or San Jose, when there's a passage of property tax laws statewide, every county has to comply with the same law. So if your readership is, is wide and touches many other uh, counties, just know that this is also relevant for them as well. Um, today, we wanted to share two major points. I think we've, we've spoken before about what Proposition 19 uh, would do. Um, however, and we won't spend too much time on that, um, I'll just go over briefly um, the high level um, impacts of that. But that being said, we really just wanted to share with you a few resources coming up. As you know, Proposition 19 uh, passed with a 2% um, uh, window, a gap, and so it won by 51%, so there's 51% of the votes voted for it, um, and 49 roughly that said no on this one, so it passed relatively um, with a small margin. Um, but that being said, it passed in November. The state just certified the election results last week. And so now we're able to formally move forward with implementation and planning for it. The one thing I will say is that the implementation of it is very fast. And so even though the law was passed in November, the state just certified it last week it's going to go into effect or the first part of it will go into effect as soon as February of next year. So very quickly. The law that was passed by voters, of course, has a lot of information on it that are requirements, but just know that the state legislature and the state board of equalization will probably take up and take a look at other requirements under other rules that they're going to be putting forward to all counties. So there's still some information that is not yet known to all of us about how we're supposed to implement the law. So there's still gonna be some pieces of it that's gonna to continue to change uh, over the next month as we get more clarity from the state about implementation. But that being said, we wanna start getting out to our constituents as soon as possible to let them know about this law change because many, many families will be impacted by this. Um, the one piece that we're going to speak a little bit more about today is around the changes to the parent to child transfer and the changes to the grandparent to grandchildren transfer. I think as many of you know, our office has been working very much with a lot of taxpayers uh, in our county to try to help them understand what they need to in order to plan for their future. Uh, many of our families in particular, um, low income and immigrant communities um, might have for example, saved up to buy a home and want to pass that home on to their children. Um, we used to be able to share information about how families are able to pass on their protected Prop 13 values to children, but that's going to change with this proposition. And so 
It has a lot of implications for families and we wanna make sure they're thinking about it now as early as they can, because in order to make some of the changes that would be required, they're gonna to need to think about it. They're going to need to talk to their family about it and make sure it's the right decision for their families before moving forward. So today I'm gonna to share with you two resources that we are putting together to make sure people have the information they need in order to plan forward. Uh, first off, our office has put together a single consolidated website that has information about Prop 19 and what the changes are. So I'm gonna share that with you in just a second and walk you through that new website so that you can share this with your constituents. The second is that we're also going to be announcing a webinar or workshop that we're going to be putting together at the very beginning of January so that we can speak about what the changes are and help people understand um, what the implications are. So again, two resources, one is a website and the second, of course, is a webinar that we're doing to help people understand it. And of course, anyone can log into the website as soon as long as they have access to the internet. So with that, I'm going to move quickly to our website so that you can see, I'm gonna start sharing my screen and I'm going to um, ask that if you see it, please nod your head so I know that, that you can see this. All right, can you see this? Wonderful. So the first thing that we wanna share with you, of course, is that Prop 19 has some implications for parent to child transfers and grandparent to grandchildren transfers. Um, under the existing law, as you know right now, families might be able to pass on their Prop 13 values to their children. For a single family homes, you're able to do it without an upper limit in terms of the assessed value. Um, and there is no requirement for the person who's inheriting the property to live there. In addition to that, for all other properties, there's also a $1 million assessed value limit that is able to be passed on in terms of a Prop 13 protected value uh, to people who inherit that. Um, under Proposition 19, um, that would change. Um, for single family homes or for families or primary residences, um, you're able to pass that on, the Prop 13 value to grandchildren or to children, so long as that child or a grandchild lives in that property as its primary residence. And not only that, there's also going to be a upper limit cap in terms of the dollar value. So that severely changes and restricts the amount of benefit that goes now to family members. Second, in terms of all other properties that are not primary residence and not, and for example, commercial properties or others, there is no ability to pass on a Prop 13 value to children or to grandchildren. So that's a very big change from what the current law allows. That's why when this law goes into effect in February, you see so many families thinking about whether they wanna make transitions now before the law goes into effect. So here we have a web page that we have put together that really tries to put a consolidated uh, group of information together for taxpayers to understand what's going on with Prop 19. So remember Prop 19 has passed, but the law won't take effect for this portion of the law that we talked about until February. So we wanna make sure people have this resource. If you see our webpage here, it's very simple, sfassessor.org backslash prop 19. Uh, later on, when you go to our landing page, our major, our, our main landing page for our website, there's going to be a link to, on our carousel that basically will scroll and you can see this link as well. But just so you folks know, um, sfassessor.org slash or backslash Prop 19. Under the page, we have it organized like we do much of our, the rest of our website. Um, I'm gonna scroll down right here and you can see we have our page organized to have number one, a brief description about Prop 19. If you click on this area where you see my cursor, there's a section that's a tab called FAQ. So if you click on here, as I just did, you see that there's also a series of frequently asked questions that we try to answer here. And then finally on the third tab over here, which I think is very convenient, is that we have also included a list of the most popular forms and attachments that typically you would think about if you want to make a claim for exclusion or you need to change ownership information. So again, we have the description, frequently asked questions, as well as related forms and attachments that might be useful for taxpayers to know. We put this all in one place because we know sometimes it's hard for people to find information and we wanna make sure that we have as much consolidated information as possible. 
So just going down this for just a moment so you can see what our website uh, includes. We don't only include um, information about what Prop 19 does, uh, how it was passed and what the impacts to law would be, but we also have additional information uh, for taxpayers. One thing that we want to make sure people know, and we have this disclaimer on our website right here, is that, of course, our office cannot provide legal advice. At this point in time, we get a lot of people who call our office to say, what should I do? How should I put my property um, in order so that I can avoid taxes or I can avoid um, certain a certain um, uh, local taxes, whether it's transfer tax, whether it's um, increases in assessed values. And we need to make sure that you know we cannot provide you legal advice. That is not the role of our organization and we cannot do that. But we do hope that this information helps you have, have the data that you need in order to seek additional professional help because every single family situation is very different. So we need to make sure that you are seeking the right legal advice, uh, right professional advice to make sure you understand the consequences. If you go down to our website, you're gonna see that we have more information about what Prop 19 means. Uh, here is a link to a video that I've done where I've explained um, what Prop 19's changes, primary changes are. Uh, this is important because sometimes people do better reading information. Sometimes they like to hear and watch a video. And so we have both of these available to people so they can see that. In addition to that, if you scroll further down, we have additional information about that summarizes the major changes. And so, as I mentioned, Prop 19 makes major changes to the parent-child and grandparent-grandchild exclusions. So you see on this chart here, which is actually a direct um, a copy from the State Board of Equalization, what those major changes are. So you can see the current law, what the current law allows, and then what Prop 19 does, right? That's gonna be important for people just to have a basic understanding of what's going on there. Um, and then finally, there's a second part of the law that I'm not gonna to speak too much into, but this is gonna be more expansive. So it actually provides more benefits to seniors who are thinking about transferring properties. And you'll see the same setup here with the same chart that provides information. Now, the one thing I wanna say is that when people are thinking about uh, Prop 19 right now, some people wanna make sure they pass on the Prop 13 values to their children. Uh, just know that, again, with Prop 19, when it goes into effect, there's going to be more restrictions <coughs> restrictions related to it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but that is the reason why many people are thinking about trying to transfer property before the February deadline. I want to make sure to stop here to uh, provide a um, note to you and just to underscore that Prop 19 for this part of it will go into effect February 16th. February 16th is a Tuesday, and the Monday, February 15th, is actually a holiday. And so for many people who are thinking about you know, that deadline, just know that you have to have made your transfer happen before February 16th because it goes into effect on February 16th. So what I recommend for many people who are thinking about uh, changing property and doing all of this work that they should plan very much ahead. You can imagine we're gonna get thousands of applications, thousands of people who are going to be submitting information to our office. Um, and if everybody did it at the very last minute, you may not get all of the work uh, through that you need to. You also wanna make sure you give yourself some time. In order for you to, for example, change ownership, you have to do something called record a change in your deed, right? And when that happens, usually it comes into our office. You have to pay an associated fee with it. But sometimes if your document is incomplete or you didn't pay the right amount, that, that document would be rejected and would be sent back to you and we would not have recorded that transaction. So that's why, again, I just want to recommend that, you know, the deadline is going to be in mid-February on February 16th. You want to get this done well in advance of that. And you want to make sure you give yourself room just in case your documents are rejected because it's not complete or there's some missing information. You want to make sure you give yourself time for that. So for people who are thinking about waiting to the last minute, don't wait until the last minute because we're going to get a lot of people who are sending us documents um, and that's going to create a backlog and a problem, um, especially if you want to try to beat that deadline. Um, the other piece that I want to just share with you, I'm scrolling back up to the top of our webpage here, is that if you take a look over here on the right side, there's a section called related contents. Do you see that on the right side? 
And for many of the community members who are saying, is this information available in Chinese or Spanish or Tagalog, just know that we have translated some major documents here. And so uh, just on this related contents, you're going to see there's a link right here that if you click it, uh, for example, and I'm just doing this right now, you're going to see a web page that has information translated into Chinese. Uh, similar to that, if you, you click on the one for Spanish, you'll see a Spanish uh, website pop up. And if you go to, of course, the Tagalog one, you'll see um, that happen here too. So just to know that that information has been translated into the three languages and are found on that same web page, just on to the right side so that it has easy access to it. So again, we just wanna make sure that people have all of this information so that they can get access to it as quickly as possible and they can start planning now ahead of time. Uh, the last piece of this website that I wanna draw your attention to because it is important is that we know sometimes when people read through these documents, they might still have a lot of questions and it might not still be very clear. And so some people like to attend webinars to be able to ask questions or to listen to someone talk about the changes. And so we are actually putting together a digital family wealth forum series in January, actually January 5. So just keep that date on your calendar. We have scheduled it for January 5th at noon. It's going to be a webinar and anyone can participate. So um, there is no limit. We, of course, people can just jump onto that um, webinar and learn from it. Um, here, you're going to see that there is actually a registration link right here. So if you click on it, you'll be able to register and make sure that we send you kind of all the link information to be able to access that website. So we hope that people will jump on this uh, opportunity to uh, join us when we do this, uh, this webinar. Uh, just to know, just for you to know, when we've done our family wealth workshops in the past, you know, we, we started this back in 2017 to provide financial information to families so they knew um, as much as was possible to really help them plan for the future. This is part of that series. We've helped you know, over 1,500 families already connect to different services. And so we hope to continue to provide this valuable information to families as they think about the future. Um, but we also are very aware that we wanna make it language accessible as much as we can as well. So when you register here, just know that there's also going to be simultaneous translations for Chinese and for Spanish as well. And we've done that in the past and we have found that to be very helpful especially to make sure that we reach as broad um, constituents as possible. So I think that really wraps up kind of the major pieces that I wanted to share with you. Again, that Prop 19 is going to have some pretty significant impacts on family planning. Um, and so we wanna make sure that you, you know that. We want you to know that the deadline for the first part of it is fast approaching in mid-February. So if you want to make any changes to things, you're going to want to do it early, especially because we're going to see a lot of people who are going to wait till the last minute maybe uh, to do it. And sometimes if your documents are incomplete, we're not able to process it in time. So we want to make sure that you don't get caught in that gap period and make sure that you actually um, are able to get what you need done early. And then finally, just to make sure you know, we have this new website that we put up here with translated materials available to you. So you have a one-stop shop to get the information you need. We'll keep on updating this as we know more. And finally, we wanna make sure that you also have access to the registration for our website uh, webinar that's gonna happen January 5th at noon. So people can learn more and invite their friends and family to, to join as well. So I think that um, covers most of the items that I have here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now and, of course, uh, answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Assessor Carmen Chu. Um, we're going to be going into a Q&A session now, if you're ready. Yeah. OK, the first question that we've got, and everyone, if you need to ask a question, feel free to use the chat function as well. So our first question is coming from Stuart Fong. He has a question about why does Prop 19 start so soon? There doesn't seem to be enough time for any planning. So Carmen, yeah. would you be able to answer that? Sure. Unfortunately, Prop 19 was written by, um, I think, probably it started off with a group of realtors, uh, state realtors, who wrote the ballot measure and wrote the language. Uh, when they wrote that ballot measure, they also wrote in specific kind of dates. Uh, and I think this is, it's been an iteration because this eventually went to the state legislature. So the way the legislation got put on the ballot included this specific date for when it would be effective. 
So unfortunately, I agree, it would be better to have more time to plan, more time to be able to give information to taxpayers, more, better to make sure we had more time to work through the kinks with the state legislature and the BOE. But unfortunately, when they put this ballot language together, they actually specified the start date. And so there's no changing it. Now that the voters have voted to approve it, that's the date that it has to go into effect. So unfortunately, though we would have wanted more time to plan for it, to get the word out to taxpayers, the fact that it was part of the language uh, that was passed by voters means that it can't be changed by, uh, by anyone. Thank you, Carmen, for clarifying that. Our second question is coming from Myron Lee, and it's a very, very good question. He has a question about our office being closed, and is there any way to still record in person or only through e-recording? That's a great, great question. And I'm really, really glad that people, uh, that Myron, you asked this question because we've received this before. And I think we have really tried to put out there on our website, uh, through press releases in our newsletter, uh, the fact that even though our office is physically open to drop-ins, we're actually open 100%, meaning that all of the functions we were able to do before, we are continue to be able to do that we're doing it remotely. So for people who are looking to record documents, so um, for other folks who may not know, when you want to record documents, um, what typically happens in like a sales or a transactions of real estate is that you will have a deed for the existing owner, right? So this deed basically says, you know, X, Y, or Z person owns a particular property. When you want to change ownership of that property, you will record a new deed that has information that shares who the new owner was and who it came from, essentially, right? And so in order to do that, you record that deed with our office, the recorder's part of our office. And um, that's what we, what, we, what we mean when we say, what do you do? Are you still able to accept recordings? It's because it's the way that you're able to uh, indicate that a change in ownership has happened. Now, our office is not physically open for drop-in visitors, but there are many ways in which people can record documents with us. And so I wanna tell you the three ways uh, to do that. Number one, you can do electronic recording. And so in many instances, if there's been a sale or some kind of transaction that happens, usually they will work with a title company to essentially get all of the documents together, whether it's recording a new deed or other things. And they will basically push that information through through a secure, a secure electronic portal with our office. Um, these are, these are um, usually done through title companies. Sometimes banks do it. And sometimes there are some legal offices that may be able to do that. But it's just to know that one option is electronic recording. Our office is committed when we receive electronic recordings before four o'clock every day that we're recording those documents on the same day. So this has been a very, this is a very important thing because sometimes the day that you make a transaction happen really matters, right? Especially if you have a deadline coming. And so again, when we see recorded documents come in, uh, before 4 p.m., we are essentially uh, guaranteeing that we record it that same day. Now, I say that only with a caveat because depending on what it looks like, you know, if all of a sudden we get 10,000 documents right at four o'clock, you know, especially if there's a huge surge, that's going to be a problem, right? So we want to just make sure that people are not waiting to the last minute to record because you need to give us the ability and time to be able to process all of that information. The second way that you can record a document with us is that you can drop off the document to our to City Hall through a drop box. There is a drop box that is uh, located on the Grove Street side of City Hall. And so uh, people is basically a secure box. You take the document that you want to record and you include your payment information and you ba or ba uh, check and then you basically just put it in this secure drop box. We actually check that Dropbox three times a day in the morning, mid afternoon, and again, right before two o'clock essentially. And so we also are committed to record those documents we receive in the Dropbox on the same day. Again, same caveat, if all of a sudden we see hundreds all of a sudden drop off in the Dropbox, um, of course, that's gonna maybe take a little bit more time, but at this moment, we're able to record everything that we're getting through the Dropbox on the same day. And then finally, the third way that we're able to record is that you can mail the documents into our office. And so you can mail that document in, we will receive it the normal way that we do. Uh, and then we will open up those documents and then of course record them as we get them also. Currently there is a backlog of about three days for recording when it comes through the mail. So we definitely suggest if you're able to do electronic recording, 
that is the first way we recommend you do it because you're able to see immediately if the document was accepted or rejected, right? So that's important because sometimes, again, the document might not be completed or you might not have submitted the right payment information. And so we want to make sure that you um, have that information as quickly as possible. With electronic recording, it's more instantaneous. You get it, that information faster. With a Dropbox uh, scenario, again, we're looking at that. We're processing that pretty fast. Um, however, um, sometimes people don't give a payment. They forget to provide a check or the check that they give is not enough. In a case like that, or if the document is not complete, like for example, it needed to have a notary signature, but it doesn't include it, then in that case, we have to reject the document. When that happens, what we have to do from our administrative part is that we take that document, we basically send a cover letter that says, we have to reject your document because of this reason. And we send the original document as well as this cover page back to you. So you can imagine if it's time sensitive, right? And you wanna record your document before this deadline, you have to make sure that you give yourself enough time that just in case it gets rejected, you give it enough time for us to mail it back for you to you and for you to give it back to us, right? We can't record it if it's not complete, if there's an error um, that we see or that it's missing payment or the payment is incorrect. So just know you wanna give yourself a lot of time in that case. And then um, finally, as I mentioned, you can mail it in. The same process is pretty much happening um, as we do see with the drop boxes. We're going to again see if the document is complete, if you have complete payment, um, and if you have payment at all. And then if it's not, we would have to send it back to you. So those are the three ways in which you can still continue to record. So please know that you can um, record your documents just as you could any other time. Thank you, Carmen. The next question is a related question. It's from Ling Ku from KTSF Channel 26. Um, since we're expecting a lot of transfer before mid-February next year, what are some extra preparation in your office to meet the need? Yeah, no, I think it's a it's a great question. Um, we're trying to get ahead of it. So um, as, as I mentioned to you, we weren't able to officially communicate or to really talk about what our plans were until the state certified the election results because they have to make the election results final and certified before we can do so. And since they did that last week, you can see how quickly put, we put our website up. It's already up and running today. Um, we are really approaching it from two angles. One, really trying to make sure that we get information and work with you right now to get information out to our taxpayers as early as possible and make sure we give you as much good information as we can in one place to make it as easy as possible for you to understand what's going on. Um, our hope is that we can work through all of you to help make sure people know that if they're interested in making a change that they think now, they start planning now because it takes time. It takes time for you to have these conversations with your family for you to get legal advice, to get professional advice. And then finally, if you decide to move forward to get all the paperwork together. So because the deadline is coming up so quickly, we wanna make sure you know it and you share it with your constituents as early as possible so they can plan at right now. Um, that's something that's really, really important. And then in terms of how else our office is working, we're going to continue and we have been continuing to monitor the volume of recordings that happen in our office and at what pace they're coming in. And we're going to have to take a look and see whether we need to increase our resources to try to trans um, to process transactions faster and more uh, so that we can help meet the deadline. But that being said, of course, we only have so many staff in our office. And even if everyone was working 100% of the time and overtime, if all of a sudden we get you know, 20,000, 10,000 applications on the last day, we might not be able to process all of that. So it's really important for us to make sure we get to you and to say, don't let that be the problem. Let's, let's make sure that you record information as quickly as possible so that we can actually do it. The one thing I wanna just say, and not, I know that it's not a question here, but I have to say this because it's really important, is that many people think, you know, in order to avoid this increase in taxes, I'm gonna transfer my property to my kids right now so that it could happen before this law takes effect. But I just want all the folks to think about that very seriously, because once you transfer a property to someone else, to your children, you no longer have any ownership of that property, right? And so if that child or your, whoever you gave it to decides to sell it, and you are, you are hoping to live there until the end of your time, you know, you may not have that opportunity. 
And so it's really important for people, you know, they're thinking about, can I do tax savings? Can I do tax savings? But it's equally important to make sure that you're protecting yourself as well. So sometimes the right choice is not to pass on the property and sometimes it is, but you need to think very clearly about that and get and really think hard about that before you make those changes. So I just wanna caution that to people because there's going to be a reaction to say, I better do it now, but just know that if you transfer your property, it's not yours anymore. And, and that could be a big, a big challenge, right? Thank you, Carmen. Um, that's very important to know. We have another question. The next coming question is from Bonnie Weinstein. She asks about if there's any chance of, re of appeal or any court challenges around Prop 19. Um, there always is a possibility, although I have not heard anybody challenge it right now. I he I've heard of no um, uh, active court challenges to Prop 19. I've heard of no court action to stay or basically delay the implementation. So it's always possible, but I have heard none. Thank you, Carmen. Um, we also have a question from Catherine Yi. She wants to um, know if there's any electronic recording can be set up with her own law office. Um, I think for that, probably um, best is for you to just send an email to me. You can just send it to carmen.chu at sfgov.org with that question, and I can forward it to my recorder manager who can talk through um, eligibility and what is required. So our electronic portal, electronic um, e-recording is actually secured um, by the DOJ, the Department of Justice. It's very important that the documents that come through and how the securities that are required um, are put into place. And so we do enter into MOUs with different entities that are submitting documents to us. Uh, so we do have a very formal process in order to secure the information that comes to us. So we can walk you through what that looks like. Um, in the past, law offices were not authorized actually to do electronic recording. It actually has been a recent change in the last few years where the law was passed that opened up that avenue for law offices. And it was actually, I think maybe just recently, not that long ago that the state legislature finally put in place all of the requirements for that to happen. So it is available, I believe now for law offices and some other entities to do electronic recording, but that wasn't always the case. So. Um, best for you just to send me an e email and I will forward you on to my recorder manager who can talk through what entering into an MOU's process would look like. Thank you, Carmen. Um, I also put in my email address in the chat. So if you have in, anyone have any questions or you want to reach out to Carmen, please feel free to email me as well. Um, at, as I'm seeing, I don't see any more questions. Um, and this is the last call of questions. If anyone wants to put a question, you can put it in the chat. So it looks like we're pretty good. Hopefully um, everyone get a chance to look at the website and find the information that you have. Please note that the frequently asked question as Carmen mentioned is continue to grow um, as we learn more information. So please feel free to check back on our website for more information later as well and sign up for the January webinar. Um, yeah. So more families would be able to learn more about this. Yeah, and you know you have uh, Vivian has Vivian has shared her website or her email address with you. Um, if you are hearing from your constituents about common questions that they are asking, or things that they're worried about, or things that um, they're frustrated with, um, if they're not able to access certain information from us, I hope you'll share that with her because we very much care about continuing to improve our operations. And sometimes. Um, what you see on the ground is really important for us to, to say, oh, we didn't realize that was happening and, and let us fix that. So I hope that you'll share uh, information with her as you go so that we can make sure our webinar is useful to taxpayers so that we make sure that our website is easy to get through to taxpayers as well. So other than that, um, I want to say, of course, just say happy holidays to everybody in advance. I hope that you all have a chance to connect even if it's virtually with your loved ones and friends, and of course, to please uh, stay safe uh, during this time. Thank you. Thank you, Assessor Carmen Chu. This concludes our media roundtable today. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at vivian.po at sfgov.org. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.